Good afternoon again, and welcome for IIDR conference. In the afternoon session, uh, we are going to talk uh, about data without borders within the theme, main theme of this, without borders or cross borders. So, uh, in this session, you already understand, already mentioned yesterday and today morning, the importance of data, and uh, now we are going to talk about data without borders. So based on the technological advances that we have now, we have access to unprecedented amount and size and volume of data. So in that sense, it's important to understand how we can use such data without borders. You know, there are opposition saying that, you know, no, we don't have such type of data, but yeah, considering different sensors that are and technological advances and different sensors that we have, collecting data, now we have much more data when we compare to last decades. So in, in terms of data, when we have data without borders, we have much more amount of data. Uh, so we can also talk about how we can analyze them and how we can use them. Today, my name is Salman Kasparian. I'm also a lecturer in geospatial science at IRDR at UCL. We co-organize this with Dr. Hu. Uh, who is also a lecturer at IRDR. I'm not going to chair the panel. I will be one of the panelists here. So just starting and introducing the session and why we are looking at the data without borders within the risk without borders. We will look at, uh, we, have, we will have different panelists from different disciplines, from meteorology, from, we have a journalist, we have a computer scientist. I will try to talk about AI and also remote sensing, how this affects data without borders, and how we can actually use this to address disaster risk reduction topic. So now I hand over the session to Dr. Soon, who's going to actually chair the session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Salman, for elegantly setting the tone for today's uh, data without borders session. I'm Kim Soon, lecturer in uh, meteorological and climate hazard risks. And uh, it's uh, absolutely my privilege to introduce our distinguished panelists here today, who will be sh sharing their insights with us. So firstly, we are fortunate to have Professor Mehmed Akshi on board. He's an excellent computer scientist with uh, in-depth ex experience in the realm of digital twins, and uh, a warm welcome to you. Next, we have the privilege to introduce Dr. Islin Johnson. Um, she's a data journalist and a reputable economist. Personally, I've been impressed with uh, all of her coverage in different topics from uh, energy to climate to technology. I'm thrilled to have you here, Islin. Joining the esteemed panel is uh, Dr. Samantha uh, Burgess. Uh, she's the Deputy Director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service and the European Center for Media Range Weather Forecast. Dr. Burgess offers a unique blend of expertise, uh, working tirelessly at the science policy interface to improve understanding of climate science. An energetic welcome to you, Dr. Burgess. And our panel won't be complete with our very own Dr. Simon Kafarin, uh, he's our in-house data scientist, and uh, he will provide pr perspective, uh, data uh, insights into data science uh, from uh, our own RDR perspective. Okay, next we will unfold today's session. So each panelist will give a very short opening presentation, each uh, for no more than six minutes. Then after that, we will go into our very vibrant panel discussion. I look forward to the exciting exchange of ideas. Let's get this started. First, Professor Amshi, please. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is, uh, I am computer scientist from University of Twente, but last three years I was in Turkey uh, working on disaster management. And basically um, we are interested 
in uh, automating disaster management processes. So what are these? Oh, this makes a lot of noise. <laughs> I, I didn't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, just, just, <laughs> it was meant to wake you up. <laughs> Okay, what is a disaster, what is a process, what is a process automation is you have to carry out a certain number of activities to accomplish certain goals. A very simple example, you go to an ATM machine and you want to withdraw money and you have to press number of buttons and you have to follow certain procedure. And this is what we call a process. And process in our case, most of the time traditionally executed by humans. We try to automate these processes. So it is maybe a different way of looking at disasters. And for example, uh, data gathering, of course, many people do that. Uh, also simulation is complementary, but we try to also detect what has happened and then starting tests. For example, test generation for us is to determine the number of uh, uh, teams uh, for firefighters or ambulances, rescue teams, to compute them automatically by uh, the help of machines and to optimize them. For example, if there are no re enough resources, you try to uh, compromise in the best way. So um, by this way, uh, you can, of course, uh, take over uh, difficult tasks like managing so many things are happening when a large disaster occurs, and we try to automate them and do them in the best way. And while you are doing, we are using a lot of techniques, of course, including AI. But this way of looking at problems probably is somehow different. But not only, of course, uh, traditional uh, intervention activities, but also evacuation and protection, distribution of aid goods. So we look at the problem from the perspective of processes. And what does it mean? This is uh, maybe not very well understandable, but okay. So we have a platform to support this. Platform should support is a model of the environment. It's a, what we call digital twin, but we have a lot of event buffers. That means you have to detect certain events that are happening, and then you start, for example, uh, the, the the related task accordingly. So the tasks are started automatically when certain events occur. So therefore, for everything, any process, I say it here, there are input events to wake up the, the, the process and then you carry out the actions and there are output events, which means probably completion of the task. And we have a process control software to check if event is uh, if the process is executed in the right way. So the whole system, we look and we structure the architecture, not from the perspective of data. Data is important because you have to, of course, use these data in the processes, but also the events, dynamic occurrence of all kinds of activities. So we think that this is uh, necessary to deal with the complexity of disaster management. So uh, the first question that immediately you have, this is our publication. In order to steer the processes, you need to define the, like you see here, process control means that you need to be able to measure the activity performance. So we are also putting a lot of uh, monitors everywhere per, actually per uh, process to measure if the process is executed in an efficient, effective way. Therefore, you need to define key performance indicators for every processes and then uh, monitor it. So it's actually an active control system, large platform distributed over many machines, taking data and acting immediately. So it's not offline, it's online system like a large communication system where we, uh, uh, for every task we run, and execute it. And when we look at the, this, traditional data-oriented architectures are like web servers. Our case, our abstraction is actually automation of tasks. Therefore, our data needs are determined by the operations that you want to automate. So what kind of operations? And therefore, you need to collect extra information like 
performance, online performance of activities. Therefore, for example, we track, we track all the intervention activities online and record them and see. And of course, it brings all kind of complications because if it, if the plant is different from the actual cases, then um, uh, then uh, you have to maybe reschedule. So basically, a task automation is mainly a resource allocation problem and optimization problem, and you have two basic problems in consistency management and conflict management. Okay, so here actually I'm talking about uh, three digital twins. Uh, in order to share events and, and uh, all kind of things like that, you need all kind of automicity. That means that everybody should see the same event in the same way. If you if you are not co uh, careful, the system may be inconsistent. Okay, so the oh, I'm sorry again. <laughs> Time to wake up. <laughs> I, uh, there should be a way to put it on. My computer is so silent. All right. So these are the questions I have. I think my six minutes is over already. We are conscious of all time. Okay. So these are the questions I have. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ainsley Johnson, and I'm a data journalist at The Economist magazine. And today I'm going to talk about how uh, we at The Economist uh, some sort of rules of thumb or um, principles that we use when we're communicating insights from data. So every week, uh, our team produces a page for the magazine. Normally, it's on the second to last page. Uh, it's also online. Um, a story, data-driven story, normally based on the news or on a topic that people are interested in um, at the moment. And we're effectively just trying to tell a story uh, with data which I'm sure is something that a lot of you have experience with, with talking about your papers um, in public. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, some sort of rules that we use uh, when we're doing that, sort of focusing on this one uh, project that I worked on back in February uh, in collaboration with an academic at UCL uh, called Ollie Ballinger, which is this middle uh, project here, uh, looking at damage after the earthquake in Turkey. So in this project, we were using a satellite remote sensing or to detect damage to buildings in Turkey. And we're specifically interested in looking at whether buildings in sort of poorer parts of town and poorer neighborhoods that may have um, less uh, sort of building regulations uh, were more impacted by the earthquake. So yeah, the principles I'm just gonna talk about just to give a little overview are getting people's attention, keeping it simple and giving people context. So whenever you're telling a story, I always think about it as if you're trying to compete for the attention of this person, listener or reader against every other million possible things that this person could be paying attention to. And in that sense, I think often data journalism can have a bit of a, or data stories can have a bit of an edge over regular stories in that you can make completely unique images that tell your story in a captivating and useful way. So in this case, we had, uh, we sort of led the story with this big map here. Um, it sort of had two roles. It kind of orientates people to, to sort of what the story is gonna be about. You can see a little map here of, of where we are um, in the world. Um, it's visually interesting and it has a lot of, you know, details on it that people can get lost on, but just from looking at it alone, um, it sort of draws people in. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to make good maps and charts, how to make them useful and how to make them interesting to people. Uh, the next thing we do to try and really grab people's attention is to immediately tell them what they're going to be taking away from reading this story. So what is the one takeaway point that they're gonna leave the story for sure with. Uh, we often put it in the title. So in this case, it was that poor areas suffered three and a half times more damage in Turkey's earthquake. And we often try and see if we can show this in a chart. So that's, you know, can really help people to sort of see that this message that we're communicating to them, they can actually see it for themselves in the data. So here we have just this simple 
line chart, a simple scatter uh, diagram where you can see that uh, areas that suffered more damage tended to be cheaper, uh, cheaper real estate per meter square. The other thing is about keeping people's attention. Typically, when we're writing stories, we get the important information in first and then gradually add more detail as we go through. So in academia, I think often uh, caveats come in up top. But in journalism, we, we normally keep them to the end. We find that they kind of lose people. People sort of lose interest if they, they see all of these um, sort of modifiers. Generally, what we'll do is, of course, the caveats are really important. We'll use words like may or could just to signify a bit of uncertainty or some conditions surrounding this conclusion uh, up at the beginning. And then leave the caveats to the end. The next thing is to keep it simple. Um, that's in charts and in text. So remove any clutter from the charts. You don't need loads of uh, axis labels. You don't need labels for every point. Um, you can use color or emphasis to highlight important data points. So here we have a couple of outliers. We generally annotate things rather than using keys. And here we have another little bit of annotation to sort of guide people how they should be interpreting this, this chart. Uh, this is a, a, yeah, I'll hear more damage. Uh, we tend to prefer showing raw data over residuals from like an analysis. If people, raw data is just easier for people to understand. It requires less explanation. Uh, in this case, this is actually a, a, a residual plot. This is uh, some results of analysis. Um, this is probably at the upper end of complexity for what we would show. But as you can see, rather than write, this is the results of some complicated residual, some complicated analysis, We've kind of tried to use simple language to just explain exactly what these numbers show. So these, this is the share of buildings that are probably damaged, I'll explain what that is in a second, compared with expected based on the average building footprint. Just try to think of more intuitive ways to phrase um, your analysis. The final thing is to give context to your results. So um, Try to express things rather than just in raw numbers. Try and give them comparisons. So, for example, if you're talking about a large area, give that in comparison to a country or a state or something that people will know. Um, the general public are not interested in p-values, but they are interested in effect sizes. So forget about writing about significance. Instead, focus on how big is the effect and find easy ways that you can describe that to people. So here we're describing it as uh, the share of um, buildings that are damaged in areas with expensive, most expensive homes and the areas with the cheapest ones. The final thing is uncertainty, which I'm sure is something uh, a lot of people here deal with um, in their papers and analysis. Um, it's really important and we don't shy away from it. We just try to display it and talk about it in an intuitive way. So we'll have error bars on our charts, but we'll explain what they mean. Uh, particularly uh, in this example, um, these different colored buildings are, uh, that's based on like a probability, that's based on a threshold uh, level of significance from some analysis. But rather than try and explain that, we just get rid of all of that information and just say sort of intuitive terms people can understand, possibly damaged or probably damaged. So yeah, those are some very quick principles of data storytelling that we use at The Economist. Get people's attention, keep it simple and give it context. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here today. Who in this room uses climate data in their daily lives or in their research? Okay, good, good handful. And who's heard of the Copernicus Climate Change Service? Oh, this is great. All right, well, I don't need to speak then. Fantastic. Anyway, so. I love what I do and I'm very excited about what I do. So hopefully I can express some of this enthusiasm in this talk. So on the left here, you have a, one of the most famous Im images of our planet. So it's the NASA Apollo 17 image taken in 1972. On the right is the recreation of that with ECMWF's ERA-5 reanalysis. So right now, our, as, as Saman mentioned in his introduction, our planet is more observed than it has ever been before. What this means is with numerical weather prediction and data assimilation, we can recreate what those astronauts saw 50 years ago. And that 
is cool. There's no other way of looking at it. So C3S, the Copernicus Climate Change Service, is a service funded by the European Union to give society free access to climate data. So we cover all time periods of climate data. We cover the past in terms of direct observations, so in situ observations from the atmosphere, from the land, and from the ocean. And of course, satellite information, because we're funded uh, by the satellite program or by the Copernicus program, which is at, uh, Europe's eyes on Earth. In addition to these observations, we also have reanalysis. And reanalysis uh, is effectively our maps without gaps. So it combines a numerical weather prediction with uh, observations that are assimilated into that model. And our era five goes back to 1940. So we have a coherent grid of products that can show you anywhere in the world what the weather was like any hour of the day. Uh, we then have seasonal predictions and climate predictions. So seasonal predictions or, or climate predictions are looking at the, the next forecast, so what's this summer going to be like? And of co course, climate projections are the same data that the IPCC used in the recent sixth assessment report. Um, so what this means is, and not only do we have access to data, and open access is extraordinarily important. I don't have time in my six minutes to bang on about how important open access is, and that's how we remove borders, by giving people access to the data so they can recreate all these exciting maps and figures themselves. But this is a storm that impacted um, Spain and Portugal in 1941. So through era five, going back to the 1940s, it means we can recreate a storm that we only have newspaper archive evidence and you know, notes in, in articles and in people's journals of the damage that this storm caused. But with reanalysis, we can go back through time and really understand what the weather system was like that caused that damage. And again, that's really cool. So as I mentioned, this is a um, reanalysis provides maps without gaps. Our global product goes back to 1940. We have a bunch of other prod products that are much higher resolution. So our Arctic reanalysis is two and a half kilometers. Um, these are all close to real time. So five days behind real time for era five in particular. And they can be used to analyze extreme events um, such as you see here on this screen. Um, it's incredibly well used in the scientific community. So the methods paper that was published in 2020 on how era five was developed is already got six and a half thousand uh, citations, which really shows the value add to the scientific community and the world at large of how useful the analysis is. So the part of C3S that I lead is climate monitoring. So we do a bunch of things. Our graphs normally aren't nearly as pretty as what the economists can produce, but, but we do our best with our scientific limitations. Um, and this is one of the figures that we showed from the European State of Climate Report that was published in April last year, uh, sorry, April this year, covering last year's weather. And 2022 was a really interesting year. It was the fifth warmest year on record, second warmest year on record for Europe, and warmest summer on record. What this means to distill it to what people can get out of it is Europeans were under more heat stress last year than ever before. We had 16,000 excess deaths in Europe last year due to heat stress. So by giving people access to this information, we can't prevent those 16,000 deaths that have already happened, but we can ensure that authorities are working with national meteorological agencies, working together to provide those warnings in place to pr protect the most vulnerable elements of society. Another really nice example of using our data, this is by a international organization that's just down the road from us in our Bonn office, so the International Renewable Energy Agency. They've used ERA-5. Um, so ERA-5 has hundreds of different variables. They've used two variables, uh, solar radiation or radiation, um, to understand uh, photovoltaic potential and wind probably at both 10 meters and 100 meters. What they've done is they've then mapped for every single country in Africa where the placement of renewable energy location should be based on the cheapest location. The um, resolution and um, it is based on our data, particularly from a temporal perspective, but they also found for things like solar, most places are as sunny as each other. So what matters most is the proximity to the electrical grid. So you don't have the opportunity 
the power failures between where you're capturing the radiation and then trying to give it out to the community. So hopefully I'm still in time, the alarm hasn't gone off, but open data really <laughs> enables better decisions to be made. And we're at a really exciting time with machine learning, with artificial intelligence. We know, for example, that all of the machine learning models, weather models that Google and everyone else has put out, they've been trained on Era 5. So this is a free use that, you know, multi mega billion organizations are leveraging our free and open products to give more information out for free, but where we're about to enter an information revolution. So hopefully we will see better management of disasters in the future through more open access data. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I will try to um, talk about this relationship in six minutes. I will try to say uh, how AI loves data without borders. I only give one example from the disaster recovery assessment. How I use AI and machine learning for disaster recovery assessment. So, just to start with a very basic explanation of what is AI machine learning and how they differ from each other. You may already know, but to clarify this, AI is a broad concept, but machine learning is a branch of a branch of AI, which is a, uh, actually try to study of computer algorithms that allow computer programs, programs to automatically improve through experience. That's it. Just learning and from our experience that this experience should come from the data. Deep learning is uh, something is a more advanced. Let's uh, we can call it more advanced. But it's mimic of the human brain, and it is somehow the state of the art now. What is very important here, um, first of all, when I say AI, it refers to machine learning, you know, in my past, because AI is a broad concept, but why I, what I call AI now here refers to machine learning. What is super important for us, you don't have to be a computer scientist or AI scientist. You should know that machine learning and deep learning methods are mostly used to process data in an automatic manner to extract insights and knowledge. That's it. You know, there isn't any magic there. So we just develop methods and algorithms to automatically. So why automatically? Because it can be quickly. You know, in the satellites, uh, we can use it for uh, automatically just extract the building damage. Is we should assess the accuracy, but you know, in general, we can use this. So, just one example I give here that I propose to use a deep learning based method for post disaster building database updating fully automatically, hopefully. I'm not going to in detail, just saying that mentioning that I used uh, crowdsource uh, data called OpenStreetMap. To automatically provide training data to train the deep learning methods and finally come out with the result of building footprints or with building footprints we can actually update the previous one. So it's important for all after the disaster to find out the extent of the damage. So we can extract the damaged buildings. We can also classify the, the type of the damages, severe one, medium, or just slightly damaged. And also, we should look at the reconstruction process and then recovery. If uh, some buildings are recovered, newly buildings are reconstructed or not. But what is important here, we need different data to train the model. It is perfect in this paper, and we say that we achieve the accuracy of more than 85%. But no, it's not that good. It's specific for that local area. It's in the Philippines. If you just pick it up and use it in somewhere else, in the, I, I mean in Vietnam, even in, within the Philippines, if you go to other areas, it is not going to work. You know why? Because we didn't have with data, the rate of data, amount of data to train the model. This is one of the reasons. Of course, it also depends on the method itself. 
But one of the problem is not having the good data to train the model. For example, here, uh, I mentioned that we achieved more than 85% accuracy in detecting the damages and also detecting the newly built buildings and finally update the building database. But just look at the uh, areas denoted by uh, yellow ovals and circles. You can see that uh, here, of course, the uh, blue areas, the ones are that false positive. There are buildings that the method should detect them, but they don't. So looking at the a bit in detail, maybe it's not really uh, clearly seen here, but they are a bit similar that our method couldn't catch them. Why? When, when I go back and look at this again after publishing this, I just realized that because we didn't have a good amount of data for such structures to train the model. So if we have such data, data without borders, in terms of types, in terms of size, in terms of the, I don't know, uh, colors, then we can train the model achieve more accuracy. Nowadays, why ChatGPT is doing well? Because it's trained in all the data that we have in the internet. So it could be the same here. So it is essential to have data without borders. But the main question again, if we have data without borders, then we have a very good machine learning model. Can we, after all, trust AI and this model, even without data, even with data without borders? Not really, because in deep learning and machine learning methods, there are black box. There are black box inherently. And we don't know how they do these decisions and finally come with the solution. But nowadays, with explainable AI, we are trying to address these issues. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so now let's uh, get started with our panel discussion. So first, uh, this is a question for our, for our Earth. So the theme of this session is that data without borders. So what do borders mean to you? What are the implications for us in terms of um, addressing global challenges? Yeah, if, if I start, um, for me, borders mean barriers. Um, so it's barriers to to understand and and leverage the the information available. Um, because I, I'm not dealing directly with disaster risk reduction. It is not about physical borders, but but I guess unphysical barriers. Yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm not always working on projects related to disasters, but um, yeah, for me, again, it, it, it's, it's barriers. It's often uh, barriers to make my work more difficult. Um, a lot of what we're doing in data journalism is very responsive. Um, we're covering topics that people that are in the news and we really need to cover them quickly because that's you know, when they're interesting and when, um, when people want to, to read about them. Um, and yeah, it, borders and data are, are a constant problem for me. I mean, trying to merge data sets with some data across different countries together, some data through time that has perhaps different methodologies. It's, um, yeah, it's just, it's challenges for me. Okay, so what I think borders are two kinds. One is uh, physical borders because you don't have access. And we see a lot in commercial organizations, they, they are very protective. And this is what I would call physical borders. Other kind of border, maybe uh, because we don't have really agreement or standardization, and therefore it is somehow difficult to access. So there are borders due to uh, non not standardization, let's say. And the third one is probably borders without, uh, because of ignorance, let's say. Uh, for example, in the process automation approach, we realize that many data are not kept because there are very few process automation uh, approaches defined. So therefore, many data are not collected because we don't know really what kind of data we should collect always. 
especially if you have a new system, you want to have a, a new kind of information that may not be available. So according to me, three kinds, physical, non-standardization and lack of ignorance, you could call it maybe, but because of technological progresses, we may not always know what kind of data we need tomorrow, let's say. I do agree with you. The borders are limited, right? Uh, yeah, again, it, it, it could be uh, physical, uh, at least if you start from the end, I guess. Uh, I'm going to also challenging if we are in favor of data without borders or not. Uh, we uh, need to actually have borders or to have borders. I can give an example of uh, fake data. You know, now AI produce deep fake. And now they entered, uh, so they're producing deep fake. I'm pretty sure they're going now to produce deep fake for disaster. So do we need actually borders or we should just completely, on a, I don't know, uh, look at this data without borders and challenge this or address this problem from other perspective rather than uh, providing some limitations to them. Thanks for all these excellent ideas and the understanding of uh, data and borders. Next, uh, we go go into a more specific topic, digital things. That's a term that has been brought up again and again with this, especially in uh, some talk, you also talked about this uh, digital thing of our Earth for us to better understand the base climate. So how can we use digital things to break the barriers and improve our understanding of our world? See, I think first and foremost, um, one of the misconceptions that I come across is that the, the digital twin will replicate reality and there will still be uncertainty, there will still be bias corrections that need to occur. There will still need to be documentation of what's been done to understand whether you can trust it or not. So I think digital twins enable us to get a higher resolution than we've ever had before. And this is due to, to machine learning and deep learning. But we still need to understand how they add data. They, they add petabytes of uh, information, well, of data, but how do you transition that data into information that's useful for society? And I think, and this is where, where I see it quite a lot, is this distillation of turning data. You know, if, if you download the, the Era 5 data set, and I've, I've lost track of the number of conversations I've had with, with journalists in particular, but with, um, you know, policymakers, whoever, and we've said our, our data is freely available for you to download, and they, they don't have the data literacy to be able to do anything with it. So that's where a lot of the work that we do, um, and I, I challenge Saman's point actually, for me it's about trust. You have to trust the source of the data. So for us, for C3S, we're funded by the European Union. So we feel we're an authoritative voice of climate data. And I think as educated individuals, you need to trust where you're getting your data and information from and ensure that it's a reliable, reputable source and that you understand how they've treated the data and that you can recreate it yourself. So I think digital twins will be a game changer, particularly on this topic. But I think we also need to build that trust in, in the outputs of those digital twins to verify that they're better and providing better and more information than what we have right now. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, digital twins are not something I really ever work with, but, uh, well, I mean, I suppose in working with sort of the data from uh, ERA5 data, I suppose I am, but uh, I think what I would say to that from a sort of journalistic point of view is, um, I think that there can be skepticism sometimes from people about, um, you know, like modeling results or sort of uh, simulations and, uh, I think that there's obviously, I mean, there's so much that, that these models can add uh, to, to our knowledge. And I think it's just very important for people to um, understand sort of how they work, understand their limitations, um, 
and for that to be explained in a way that is not intimidating and not going to just put people off and, and make them uh, disinterested. Um, and yeah, and, and another thing actually that was Salman was talking about, I suppose this sort of links into you know um, fake data and data that is that you're supposed to you know um, like you're saying these, these sort of deep fake uh, types of information. Um, I think another uh, I think a, a sort of growing role for the media and as seeing it a lot, particularly through the Ukraine war is doing, um, you know, having people on the team who are real specialists in, in this kind of uh, information and people who can go through and bring together, you know, say, uh, I'm thinking, for example, about, uh, you know, fake or videos that um, online of destruction or bodies on the streets in parts of Ukraine. And um, a lot of journalists are using now satellite data from independent sources, sort of bringing together, you know, data from... Um, from say uh, open sources, but also data from companies like Maxar and Planet to, to try and um, mm -hmm. sort of match this up with other sources of information to try and um, you know see whether they, they fit and try and verify this information. So I think that I think that it's a concern, of course, um, but I think that people will always have ways to uh, you know just through multiple sort of points of triangulation verify whether information is, 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 um, is fake or real. Okay, so I think digital, if you focus on digital terrain, the digital terrain is very important uh, to set, to, to, to remove the borders. So we, we have a basis then, if you have a digital terrain, but we need to, to have a, a measure of accuracy and preciseness. So the, the data, uh, so it's also a mathematical problem or so we need a, a digital twin is essential, but we, we need to have a measure on preciseness and accuracy, and this will give us a, a, a trust somehow. So this will give us a trust, but a digital twin means also modeling. So modeling means also a definition of standards and the syntax and semantics. So therefore we have to also agree on all these. And if we have models, models must be multifaceted. So you cannot have one single model for everything. So it means multiple views. So you have to define different views on the model. And uh, of course, if you have multiple views, then you need to have consistency among the views. So it's like in every uh, scientific progress we have is modeling has these challenges. But also, uh, in my ex experience, uh, we need also uh, some, if we talk about multifaceted modeling, uh, then we need also dynamic information, changing information, online information. Uh, so digital twin is not easy to design as we hope, but it is the right way. And uh, like in any science, uh, I think we should progress on that direction to remove the borders. Okay, what is digital twin? Do you know? Just raise your hand. Okay, let me explain what is digital twin. Uh, I'm not going in details. Digital twin uh, starts with data collection, then processing the data, then simulating all the uh, physical objects or the systems that we are aiming to actually model them, then use the outcome with, you know, uh, testing different scenarios. It looks like a conventional simulation model, isn't it? But how it differs from the other one is that it should be dynamically updated with a, let's say, real-time data stream and real-time data processing. So you can just now understand how it is important. But from First step to the last one, we all engage with the data. Collecting data, pre-processing data, using data as information to simulate the environment, then also finalize it by uh, using the output. And the important part is to do some intervention. And we can using this information in disaster context 
to, uh, let's say, uh, informed decision making. So, uh, if we have more data, then we can more precisely develop a digital twin. Actually, we can more precisely model the system or the object, whatever we are looking at. And it, it has really very good impression. You know, whatever you are going to do, it's brilliant. You know, just establishing a digital twin. I, I, I think that myself, it's what we need for uh, optimizing the efforts in disaster risk reduction. Uh, also, there was another uh, uh, part in deepfake. We already have some suggestions how we can uh, address this. You know, we need to, uh, I don't know if you still, if you also look at as journalists, the data are coming. What is the source of the data? Don't, then we need to look at the data sources, if we can trust them or not. Excellent, we can do that, but still there are some challenges. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the sharing. It's um, really exciting to learn the advancement of digital twins and uh, how this important tool can be applied in various aspects to improve our life. And um, we just uh, embarked on this uh, important topic, AI, and also deep fake, as uh, Simon mentioned. And uh, I don't know the panelists here have interaction with ChatGPT or not. That's a cliche these days, but uh, we are really concerned about uh, the uh, its quality. The answer they give us are they trustful. So, how do we deal with the ethics issues related to AI and all these kind of data-based tools? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Okay, so in our case, research um, AI we use uh, not as a big monolithic block, but uh, wherever there are problems of uncertainty. So AI is is also formulated as a continuous. In our case, it's continuously active. It's continuous learning, continuously improved. So on all uh, decisions we make where uh, there is uncertainty, we build uh, learning systems. And it can be deep learning or it can be as simple as statistical learning, depending on the problem. We use these to remove uncertainty. So for example, very good that you summarize digital uh, twin. Digital twin is a reference model we have. And there we try to get the information, interpret and understand. But also we use digital twin to track online activities like intervention. And there are many cases where we cannot precisely determine the parameters where we apply AI techniques to learn. And for us, it is more like problem solving way of reducing uncertainty. But if you, I think my opinion is that if you don't know what you want to do, AI cannot help you. So in our case, it is for reducing uncertainty in uh, digital twins, you may call it. Uh, with regard to uncertainty, I mentioned even if you have a very good deep learning model and it, sh it looks like that it works well, we cannot trust that model even because we don't know how it makes decisions. What is the reason behind of that decision has been made? And what are the characteristics? What are the properties? What are the indicators that it used to make this decision? Okay, nowadays there are plenty of publications, researchers that doing their research and say that, okay, we developed a new deep learning model. In this case study, uh, we can detect the building damages with more, you know, above 90% accuracy. I challenge them if they can, you know, prove that their model will work in other locations as well or in other, you know, type of disaster. For example, if you train your model to detect the damages to buildings uh, in an earthquake scenario, it will not work most probably for the typhoon cases. So 
There are so many uncertainties, even within digital world. We need to use machine learning because we need to process the data very quickly because we call it a, a real-time modeling. For real-time modeling, we should do all the processes very quickly and have the automation in processes. So we need machine learning models to quickly process the data for a large scale study area. So we definitely need them, but we need to tackle them. And recently, more works are coming up for in explainable AI, how we can explain how that model just made decisions. Or we can, um, we may also develop methods inherently can be explained. You know, based on the uh, algorithms that we can provide. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, AI is something that we uh, use sort of in a few different ways. Um, just generally, I think it's very useful for coding, um, particularly regex functions. I don't know if anyone ever uses them. They're a nightmare. But, uh, just chat to GPT can just tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we also use AI sometimes. Um, I mean, this is maybe very relevant to, to the topic of the, um, topic of the panel, uh, to, you know, to, to fill in data that we don't know, um, we don't know what, what the data point is um, there. So one a big example that uh, our team has been working on for, for a long time um, is uh, sort of quite unrelated to, to sort of natural disasters, but, um, Still disasters uh, is a model to predict the excess deaths um, from COVID nineteen. So their um, countries throughout the pandemic were publishing death figures, um, but really what is important is is the excess deaths. So not just the deaths that were attributed to COVID, where people had had a test, but deaths that were far higher than normal, um, and that were probably directly or indirectly related to to COVID. Um, and countries were publishing these excess death figures, but you know, mainly um, sometimes by a, a yearly basis. Some countries um, weren't publishing them at all. Uh, so a few members of our team built a, uh, a machine learning model to take the known data that we had uh, from countries that were publishing excess death figures regularly and trying to train it. It was a complete black by box. It is a complete but um, feeding it in information about cases and um, you know environmental conditions, basically anything and everything, and using it to predict for the places that we did not have data for how many deaths we might have expected in, in these places, and um, we use it to to get an estimate of the, the true death toll of the pandemic. And I think in those sorts of cases, of course, um, you know this is a very very specific problem. And um, I can I can completely understand what you, what you're saying is that you know having it as a black box in some ways it's quite limiting. I mean, with that we don't really know what it is, what are the exact parameters that are driving these predictions. Um, but there's no other way to, to get predictions of, of of this. I mean, without throwing in a lot of our assumptions about uh, what are the, the factors driving excess deaths. And I think. Um, yeah, to, to me, that's that really adds a lot of value. If I may add something, yes, please. So, uh, deep, deep learning is typical, of course, it's not black box, but in our case, we have small AIs, let's say machine learning algorithms, uh, when there is a control parameter that we cannot determine. So, uh, what we do is in the feedback in the loop. So, uh, for example, you say is the parameter 0 0.5 or 0 0.6? Then uh, we try to, uh, when we adjust it to 0 0.5 to 6, and then we apply it in the real control case, then we measure immediately parameters if there is improvement. So in the feedback in the loop, sometimes very simple machine learning, by the way, not no need to be complicated. Then we try to get uh, the feedback if the indeed the newly learned parameters are uh, better. But of course, if you have a large image and you do deep learning and this kind of processes, it's not applicable, this kind of control schemes. But if you are, for example, directly 
uh, ambulances, firefighters, and so on, and then you apply certain strategy to bring them to where you need, and there you may have small adjustment by AI. So AI, machine learning is, of course, include many different kinds. In our case, in feedback control mechanisms, you may have a measure of the success, but of course, many times you try these things also in simulations to see if you can improve. Uh, so, uh, but it doesn't work for large big images as you pointed out. So there may be techniques where you can use AI in smaller scales to optimize the online going processes. So I'm sorry about chipping in here. I'd like to challenge you a bit okay. from uh, the perspective as a physical climate modelist. Mm -hmm. So we know like these days, especially in the past several months, we've been seeing a bunch of uh, deep learning based uh, yep. numerical prediction models. They all claim to outperform the ones in your agency, you see MWF. They do claim that. Yes. So which made me very worrying. Well, I lose my job. What's the answer from UCMWF? So I, well, I can't answer for your direct circumstances because I'm not as familiar with your research as perhaps I could be. Um, but the, so we have done a analysis. So we've invited all of the um, machine learning weather models in to give a presentation to ECMWF. And then we've directly compared their scores uh, with the ECMWF multi-model ensemble. So um, for those of you who aren't as familiar, perhaps, as um, uh, Ting and I with weather prediction, so it's not just one model. It's um, for ECMWF, we run a ensemble of 100 members. And so we, we're looking at the distribution of uh, everything within those 100 members to understand the statistics of probabilities of particular weather events. And where uh, we find the biggest divergence between machine learning models and our model that is you know, developed by scientists and, and based on the laws of physics is if you talk about mean state weather, then they're, they're fairly comparable. If you talk about extreme state weather, then the ECMWF model normally edges out over most of the, most but not all, of the extreme weather events that we've interrogated, the, the ECMWF model is more accurate at defining the hurricane track, for example, than the machine learning model. But I think we do need to adapt as well. And I think machine learning is here to stay. So how do we build it in so that we can improve our resolution, improve our or reduce our uncertainty, make sure that data is accessible to the people who need it, but trusted as well, so that it is not uh, coming from a black box that people then don't know, particularly if they're relying on it, whether it is a true representation of what has happened or what will happen. And I think we're, we're not there yet, but we will be in the next decade. So we definitely need to adapt and evolve, bring in these new techniques and, and improve what we're doing alongside Mm -hmm. the automated process, but I, I, I don't think meteorologists are going to lose their job in the next decade or two. I'm much <laughs> sure now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, since we are here also talking about um, data, especially breaking the, the barriers, with the AR, with all these tools, let's uh, shift the topic a little bit to the open science. How are we really moving our data science? towards the open science to break all the barriers. What are your experiences and thoughts for the future? Um, yeah, so this is something I think about quite a lot um, and it is one of my favorite topics as well. I, for me, open science is a game changer. Um, and, and now I'm kind of, well, I'm also in the luxurious position that if I am working with other scientists, you know, we have a general policy that we won't publish in journals that require subscription fees or page charges. We will only choose open access journals because I, I am funded by taxpayers and I feel like everyone should have access to the information that I'm producing. And I feel this is my personal philosophy, but I feel like any other scientist that's funded by taxpayers should also make this leap of faith to not chase 
the citation index of the journal, but to chase the, the open access, the accessibility of your data, of your expertise to ensure it's relevant for society. And this will then change those impact factors in the future. So for me, it's critical, but I think the, the authority and the trusted source is also really critical. It's great that there's open source data everywhere. And, you know, I get challenged all the time. We, we work with a media agency and they ask me to, to fact check things. And ultimately, I don't have the time because there's normally some nutter on the Internet. He's grabbed a graph, cherry picked some data and gone. The curve is not what you say it is. And it's like, well, here's our data set. You can replot it directly from ours. Here are the other four international data sets that we use. You can replot it from theirs because they're open access. And that's the Met Office the NOAA, NASA, and the Japanese reanalysis as well. So you know, go for it, prove me wrong, but you know, it, you've got to choose your battles. And I think really relying on trusted open source and, and ensuring that the media also leverage trusted open source for their stories is really critical. Yeah, I mean, obviously from a, from a media point of view, it's great if we can read your articles and we can see the data because it makes it so much easier for us to, to use. Um, but I guess one thing I, I will say is, I mean, it, it's, it's so great and there's so much data available now, particularly on topics like climate and um, yeah, satellite imaging imagery for uh, looking at covering natural disasters. Um, but I, I, there is definitely, and I don't think this is the fault of open science, and, and I don't really know how you get around this. There's there's huge biases in what data is available. So, you know, a natural disaster in Europe is infinitely easier to cover than a natural disaster in Africa. Um, obviously, you know, satellites go over the whole world, but um, b basic things like you're talking about open street map, open street map, um, you know, if we wanted to look at, say, mapping damage to, to buildings, um, the first place that the first story we ever did, which was sort of based on, on some of that work, was in Ukraine, and there was great coverage from OpenStreetMap. The next one we did was in Turkey, and it was far poorer. Um, and you know, there there are parts of the world where you just can't get good data, and um, often the places that do supply data uh, are not government bodies. It's not coming from EU grants, it's private companies that are collecting this data. And, you know, that's the only way that we can get a hold of it. So I think, of course, um, open science is great and amazing, but um, it sort of changes, you know, it, it's then kind of the, the choice of, um, it's the, the funders who are sort of deciding what what's going to be, what data they're going to provide. Um, it, it just kind of shifts. It, it's almost a bit like like with open open publishing. Um, you know, rather than it being the libraries or, or individuals who are paying to view the material, it's the scientists themselves who are paying to to have it out there. And it just changes a bit um, who where the sort of motivation is coming from. And um, I think that's probably something that, that just needs to be thought about going forward to, to try and make, as we're discussing today, data without borders, where we have coverage, um, you know, we have data about uh, things we want to know for the whole world. So um, I, I think uh, this is, uh, of course, this event now is a very good thing. Uh, so we are now discussing these issues, the borders and removing borders. I personally, I've been working on it as well. So I'm um, working on um, starting a, some sort of alliance, international alliance, and uh, currently uh, Malaysia uh, is part of it, the University of Malaya, and we have also interacted with the Malaya, Malaysian government. Uh, I also um, had interactions with Brazil, uh, also uh, federal uh, government of Sao Paulo, uh, and uh, so they have uh, agreed on uh, starting discussions that, about setting up the rules and standards and uh, uh, so I hope, of course, I was uh, yesterday in University of Bristol. I talked to scientists there and uh, asked their opinion and help also to participate in uh, the movement, which you have started here with this event. Um, so I think we should form some sort of alliance 
uh, from, with different disciplines, and we should start discussing how to uh, define the how to remove more borders, what kind of standards we need, how to how do we approach this problem. Uh, so uh, I I hope uh, in my from my case I would be very of course extremely happy if I could set up such an organization. Uh, we have already succeeded to some degree. Can I, we are also talking with Canada. Uh, I will be going next week to British Telecom uh, and I will discuss with them also the issue of removing borders. But in order to, of course, share data, share information, as I said in my first uh, statement, uh, we need to have, uh, we need to remove physical borders, but also we have to agree on the standards, let's say data architecture, and also uh, what we want to do with it. In particular, as I said, I'm interested in process automation and process automation may demand new kinds of data and very much online uh, data. Uh, so I hope uh, we come all together and form an alliance and make a statement to the world that how world should be and uh, start building on creating the world without borders, data without borders. So I think we really have to organize and somehow formally in some way. So for me, uh, it, it uh, let's say study starts with most of the cases with data collection, then data analysis and the last part that most of the time is missing is sharing information. It's not only about open size or open publication. When we go to the disastrous areas and when we talk to them, collect information, doing some surveys and interviews, we should go back and share the results because they, are, they can also use the results. Of course, this is important to also share in open access, uh, also provide the data in open sources, but also going back to people who are not necessarily going to read the papers and share the information, share the results that they can use to improve their resiliency or decrease their vulnerability. But again, I agree with all of them that we should promote, actually we promote this at UCL and IRDR open uh, access publications. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks for the sharing about the understanding of uh, open science and uh, open data. Then um, we are really coming to an end uh, about this panel discussion. So I'd like our panelists to use just a few sentences to summarize the data without borders approach in your mind. If you'd like to like uh, summarize your approach in your work and data without, without borders, what is it? Um, so I think for me, ensuring that society has the ability to leverage data to make better decisions, that, that's a fundamental personal philosophy that I believe in. The challenge with that, or the challenges with that are numerous. Um, one um, was mentioned just before, the, the north-south divide. Um, the, the Southern Hemisphere is ultimately much less observed and has much less um, uh, experts to take advantage of the satellite infrastructure that is global right now. So capacity building, knowledge exchange is extraordinarily important to build that capacity for local people to make local decisions rather than international people or Northern Hemisphere people sharing data and expecting local local people to a understand it and b do something with it i think the the other challenge with open data is ensuring people understand the limitations of the data um, so a, a very short example um, we've had some you know lengthy conversations with a journalist in norway um, who pointed out that our data set era 5 which is a gridded product the grid size is 31 kilometers was different from the weather station where he was living in Norway 
And we were like, yes, it is different. This is a 31 kilometer grid and where you live is on the coastline. So our grid takes up a bit of ocean and a bit of land. And they, there is a, a differential, but it's well known, it's documented in our documentation, which we can refer to you in this you know, technical report, page number XX. But he didn't fundamentally understand the difference between a weather station and our data. So enabling people to understand how they can use the data, what the limitations are, is also part of the package of open data and removing those borders from using the data and using it in the right way. And I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's just giving me a bit of inspiration for what I'm gonna say. Um, I think I would say for me, data without borders would be um, being able to write the same stories and cover uh, you know, the same sort of topics that I can in Europe, I would love to be able to cover them in Africa, in Asia, in every part of the world. Um, and right now that's just not possible in part because the data doesn't exist, but also because, you know, we don't come out, we don't sort of come up with stories out of thin air. You know, we get, we get ideas from, from academics. Sometimes it's, we're writing about papers. Other times, you know, we get um, talks from sort of local news organizations or we see other people's analysis on, on things and we work with them to build on that. And, you know, as you say, the expertise is um, is very sort of or, or what we see anyway is very kind of Western, Northern centric, and um, yeah, I would love if if we had sort of more access to stories from other places. So, I agree with all your statements. My addition could be maybe I would say uh, let's have a, we should have a canonical agreement on this. So um, my opinion, okay, maybe important, but not that, that important unless we have a canonical agreement from a multidisciplinary perspective. So I think if we accomplish that, then uh, life will be easier for us to influence or to be effective. So uh, I will have a meta statement that we should have a canonical agreement on open data and for this disaster management issues. Uh, and this should be multidisciplinary. So that's what I would say. Another means here by experts agreement on this issue. It's a meta statement. Yeah, thank you. That's great. So there are so many things to say about data without borders. I just talk about from talk about it from AI perspective. And AI loves data without borders. As I mentioned, we need uh, much more data uh, in, in terms of type, if you have different types of data, um, in terms of amount of data, volume of data, um, looking at different locations, then we can provide, we can develop much more better, let's say, perfect uh, machine learning or AI based models. So definitely we should remove the borders in, in any sense, but we should also have some control measurements to you know, address the challenges. Do not be really used it in a paid one. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. So now we will leave the time to our audience for some burning questions. Okay, sir. I think it's on. Yeah. Um, thank you for a great discussion. I think many people have been starting to touch on on this point a little bit, but you know, you, you've been talking about the importance, of trust, the importance of open data, data without borders. And I think one of the um, phrases that that I like to, or one of the people I like to borrow a phrase from when it comes to openness is there's a philosopher in Cambridge called Onora O'Neill, and she talks about not the importance of openness, but the importance of intelligent transparency when it comes to openness, which I think touches a little bit on what Saman was saying about not necessarily the need for regulation, but the need for you know thinking about some some of the issues that might come with with being fully um, transparent about these things. 
And, and one of the um, ideas that she, she says is important for intelligent openness is making information accessible, which comes down to uncertainties, both about, as, as you were saying, about you know being transparent about statistical uncertainties, but also then the quality of the data as well. And I think, I wonder whether the onus is on the data science community to some extent to start to develop some kind of scale that you can rate the quality of data that's coming out like you have in, in the medical community or some of the what work centers for rating um, you know, quality of policy impact. And um, so I was just wondering if you could m maybe reflect a bit on what such a scale would, would look like, what, what, what the um, components of good quality data might be, you know, might it be consensus, might it be um, not being a black box decision making and, and so on. Um, I can start on that one. Um, I think there's a question at the back on the, the far end as well, if the microphone can make its way up there. Um, so for us, we um, have a, a, and it's one of the parts of the program that I lead, so we have an evaluation and quality assurance component to the program to enable users to trust, um, well, to effectively help them to choose a data set and to therefore trust why they're using that data set. Um, and this evaluation protocol is done by external scientists to us. So we, we run a contract which people competitively bid for, and we're going through the process of redefining it because the, the previous process was, was still quite convoluted. And it's a question when you're dealing with, so for us it's all climate data records, that often um, you know, when, when is a good climate data record? Ideally, you need at least 30 years, but for some sensors on satellites, there is new technology, so we don't have a 30-year reference period yet. We will, but not yet. So it, it shouldn't prevent people from making decisions now. But I think really enabling users to understand what the limitations are of the data set. And for me, that's much more important than uncertainty, because I think and, and I've had many conversations internally about, you know, many scientists like uncertainty is really important. And it's like, no one cares if it's 5% or 10%. It is mostly right, is mostly good most of the time. So let's focus on what people are trying to make a decision on and frame what we're, how we're providing data based on the decision that they're making when the 5 or 10%, whether it's 5% or 1%, doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, how much heat stress is there in Athens and what do they do about it? Because it's only going to get worse. So let's make sure that we're intelligently asking the question of what do users need. And the, the answer is that that, that is an enormous spectrum and you can't possibly deliver everything. So I think it, it's co-creation as well as dialogue to ensure that you're working with the users of your data to understand what they need and you're developing it in a way that works for their requirements rather than thinking you know other people's requirements and then no one uses your data set because you didn't get it right. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> So, hi, my name is Lisa Dankford and I'm a lecturer in global health here at IRDR. So my question is, how can we move towards a more ethical and moral, moral conversation on AI, data science and remote sensing, given that we're working in, a, in the humanitarian sector? Because the work that we do affects humans. So although you may not be using human participant data, it does have an impact. So. <laughs> you make <it>. okay. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, uh, it's actually also about you know trusting AI included. One of them is ethical AI. Uh, if we can uh, again have some controlled measures on AI, first of all, we should understand how this model is working. Then we can have some rules or regulations to control it also in terms of ethics. So that's from my own perspective in AI, how we can do that. Are we doing that? No. Can we do that now? No. Maybe in the future. Yeah. Shams? Yeah, um, yeah I'm Shams uh, from IRDR. Fascinating talk and the discussion so far. Shams, Shams. wait for the mic. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the fascinating talks and the discussion so far. The word I was looking for throughout this session is validation. Because I think we can do a lot when we go without borders, but we probably cannot eliminate borders because we need borders, either physical or logical, because this is where we collect ground-based observations. And I think without validating our satellite data or simulation or AI-generated data with ground-based observations, no matter how fancy model we can develop, the ultimate impact will be questionable. So how do you go about validating data? Thank you. Sure. So uh, what we try to do is uh, data fusion. Uh, so collect information from multiple sources and try to, uh, of course, it depends on the kind of information uh, you have. So the more granularity of data collection is smaller, the more automation you have, the more sensors you have. For example, I'm now working in a, in a lab setting where about 45 different data sources, we try to uh, gather uh, and, and make it data fusion. But in order to make data fusion successful, you have to define the objectives. And of course, it's a complicated stuff. But this, this is a way, I think, to increase the effectiveness of the uh, decisions you make. So that's one way, but uh, as I said, this is is quite complicated because of many possible data sources and it's quite expensive. So our challenges, for example, limited to earthquakes at this moment, is we have four objectives to determine the damages done and to uh, find out where the living people are under the rubble, for example, to determine the coordinates and uh, to make them affordable, reasonable price, cheap, and uh, the time. So uh, the question is to find out optimal composition of data sources uh, where you can satisfy these four objectives. Uh, and uh, also without, of course, you when you collect information, you may uh, interfere with the privacy of people. So there are also laws that uh, make it sometimes difficult for you to get information. So uh, it is uh, for us is an optimization problem, uh, satisfying these four objectives. And so I'm working on actually synthesis, automatic synthesis, of finding out the best composition of data sources to have maximum effectiveness and within the constraints as I specified. So that means probably a lot of sensors, a lot of data units everywhere. Mm -hmm. But then again, the problem of privacy comes to picture. So it is uh, trying to find your way in a constrained space of money, time, and uh, laws, privacy laws. But we are working on it. I think data fusion is the, the way you can, uh, you can try. So that's my way of working on it. Okay, we are really conscious about time. So I'll leave the last question to our yeah, students. Just a quick one. Uh, I'm Shi Yi Zhang, the first year uh, PhD candidates of RDL. I just have a very quick question. Uh, for countries that uh, like uh, strong uh, data transparency, uh, besides collecting and utilizing data from the uh, reputable international organization or uh, third party research institution, what are other ways to uh, choose uh, trusted words and correct data? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll start. So I think um, if they so if they're publishing in open journals, if they're publishing the code that they've used to um, create any graphics or data visualization on GitHub that gives you the automatic opportunity to, to try and recreate what they've done. And if you can recreate what they've done, and if you can use a complementary data set to prove the same thing, then you, you can probably add that data set to your um, volume of data sets with confidence. 
And I think um, I, I would also go with experience. So you're you're in a fantastic institution with a, a lot of expertise. So also leveraging the expertise of others of, you know, you've got this particular problem wherever you're working in the world, where have those people found useful data sets and, and leveraging their network as well of, you know, have they been to that location? Do they know scientists there? Speaking directly to people who may be aware of different data sets than, than what we're aware of in the UK is also really important. Great, thank you. So to ramp up this uh, data session, ramp up our panel discussion, I'd also like to leverage some data science-based technique, GPT, to ramp up <laughs> this session, give you a few sentences to summarize today's uh, thoughts. <laughs> okay. So this is what the China GPT tells me. Okay, let me read that aloud. In summary, the panel discussed the implications of data borders in disaster reduction and the limitations they present. They also explored the potential of digital twins as a tool for addressing cross-border issues related to climate change and natural disasters. The importance of promoting open science and data sharing policies was highlighted, while also acknowledging the need for rules and standards. The panel also discussed the potential threats posed by AI-generated fake data sets and the importance of collaboration among experts from different fields to create a more cohesive data without borders approach for addressing global issues like climate change. That's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it uh, gives us some insights. <laughs> <laughs>